tonight, uh, David is going to be speaking about his recent findings in the field of global religious history. His talk will cover different evolutionary stages that all religions appear to have gone through, surprising twists and turns in the development of monotheism, and how all of our major religions appear to share the problem of having imaginary founders and more. So let me introduce David. He has a very important impressive bio and background. So strap in for it. Okay. David Fitzgerald is an atheist author, public speaker, and historical researcher who has been actively investigating the historical Jesus question for over 20 years. He was an associate member of CSER, the former committee for the scientific examination of religion. He lectures around the world at universities, national secular events, churches, and secular and religious groups. He has appeared on the Atheist Experience television program and in several documentaries, including Batman and Jesus, which sounds amazing, uh, My Week in Atheism, and most recently, Marketing the Messiah. He has a few books out, including Jesus, Mything in Action, and that is the follow-up to his classic on Jesus mythicism called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All, uh, as well as The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion. And we're going to hear about his latest book this evening. So, David, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Well. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Let me get this poll out of the way so I can actually see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. And, yeah, I'm going to close that poll. And too. recovering from religion is actually a huge part of this because it was appearing on Recovering from Religion's podcast that uh, first got the ball rolling on this book. In fact, uh, when I did a, a talk about uh, is your really? founder figure imaginary? Yep, yep. So there's there's <gasps> very good I connection. Didn't know that. Excellent. Well, okay. I'm glad to hear that that was how that went. And we are super excited to have you back. I cannot wait to hear about it. Um, do you want to just to start off, tell us a little bit about your latest book? Sure. Um, it's called Playing God. And just like Jesus Mything in Action, it started out as one book and it has turned into three volumes of a single book. Um, the first part talks about as you said, the evolutionary stages that all the major world religions seem to go through from prehistory all the way up until today. Um, the middle part, which didn't start as the middle of the book, it just was going to be part of the book, but it just kept growing, was about the surprising history of monotheism. It's called the gods of monotheism and talks about how it's not just a straight shot from polytheism to monotheism, but, um, but it's taken some really weird twists and turns and it's not a given that our God, Jehovah, was going to be the one true God all along. There was lots of other options as well. And then finally, of course, the third part, the most exciting part, is where we look at the, the top 10 world religions today and see if anybody else is having the same problem that Christianity does of our founder figure, maybe not being real at all, maybe being 100% imaginary. And... Um, it's, it's fun to guess how many of the religions share that problem. Ooh, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. I cannot wait to dig into it. So um, what you mentioned that recovering from religion was kind of part of what got you started down this path. How did you start thinking about this topic and what made you want to dig into this so much that you've written so many books about it? What yeah. are the kind of implications of this and, and where does your interest come from? Sure. Well, for me, it started with the Jesus historicity question, because I've been doing that for over two dozen years now. Um, and I was talking before the show, one of the interesting side effects of looking into the historical Jesus question is having Buddhists come up to me and say, yeah, we're having the same discussions in our circles, whether Buddha existed or not. And having ex-Muslims come up to me and say, yeah, you know, we're having the same discussion in our circles of whether Muhammad existed or not. And like Buddha, I could see, but Muhammad, that blew my mind until they started saying, well, yeah, because this, 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 and this. And it's like, oh, he's starting to sound a lot more like Jesus when you put it that way, um, including all the problems we have for the historicity of Jesus. Um, so much so that, spoiler alert, it looks like of all our top 10 religions in the world today, all of them, all of them have a dodgy founder figure who was probably 100% imaginary. Wow. 
That that is really interesting. And you know, I was thinking earlier as I was describing the show to someone um, about how you know, and maybe you can comment on this. I know it's become a thing among some religious circles uh, lately. And when I say lately, I mean probably over the last several decades, if not century, to kind of have this belief that, you know, their religious text is a literal history of true events that transpired exactly as written. And it is a correct and factual recording of events. And I wonder if that, I, I don't wonder, I'm pretty sure that that is not necessarily necessarily what the intention of the original authors of those books was. Kara, um, yeah. <laughs> <that at all? laughs> yeah. And the strange thing is we tend to like give the historical parts of it at least a passing, you know, uh, oh, I'm sure something more or less happened like this. And it's like, yeah, no, 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 no. The, the Exodus, nope, did not happen whatsoever. It's not even an exaggeration or anything. Nope. Um, uh, again, um, one of the things that surprised me the most, two and a half years ago or so, I was working on, on a book of sex and violence in the Bible. If you've ever seen my talk, Sexy Violence, Violent Sex, The Weird-Ass Morality of the Bible, I was in the <laughs> process of turning that into a book. Um, and then I started hearing and again none of these are my ideas i'm not making this stuff up this is all me reporting on what the historical findings are right now from people who are far more uh uh, uh entitled to speak about this than i am uh, uh so um but what's happened happening just within the last not even three years it's been more recent than that is that Historians are discovering that, for instance, for instance, um, Judaism, the practice that we know today, doesn't seem to go back beyond the second century BC. Uh, uh, Moses, the figure of Moses, first appears in a non-Jewish setting in the fourth century BC, first appears in any kind of Jewish writing in the third century BC, um, a thousand years later than we expect. Um, get turning to Islam, Islam, everything in the story we know about Muhammad, just down the line, we can say, well, that's not true. 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 And for about the first 50 to 60 years of Islam, there is no sign of Muhammad. Nobody talks about him. Nobody has stories to about him. It's not until generations later that suddenly, oh, we've got all these stories about Muhammad that just showed up and they contradict each other. There's literally hundreds of thousands of them that have all been whittled down to about 6,000. Um, and, uh, and yeah, even still, we ha they contradict each other um, to the extent that there's no way that the, the official story that we have of Islam could possibly be true. It just couldn't happen. Whether there was an actual mob or not, couldn't happen that way. And the more I look into all these religions, the more it seems like trying to insist that, oh, well, Muhammad was real, or Jesus was real, or Moses was real, we're barking up the wrong tree. It seems like it's normal for these religions to start out with purely imaginary founder figures. Ah, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And, and maybe it's only, you know, relatively recently that people have become so interested in this idea that, oh, in order for this to be important and meaningful and relevant, I have to insist that it's all 100% a, a true recounting of actual events rather than thinking of it as a collection of stories, perhaps, that are meant to impart some message. Where do you think people got off on that track? How, how did we go down this path where now we're having to have this discussion about something that, you know, as an outsider, Outsider looking in to read it, you wouldn't think this sounded like a true story. <laughs> right, right. Get out of my brain, Kara. That was that's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, um, the first part of the book we go through all the different evolutionary stages, and like religion is so different depending on which millennia you're looking at or which stage of civilization you're looking at. And it's almost as like, if you tell me who your God is and how you worship him, I can tell you what stage you're in. Are you in the tribal stage? Are you in a city-state stage? Are you in a, 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 a imperial stage? And the more that, the bigger that society gets to where you have multicultural uh, 
um, collections of people and they're all under one single roof, that's when you first start to get not pantheons, not nature gods, but a, this transcendent type of God who loves everybody equally and you just have to believe in him and follow what he says and follow his rules. Um, oh, so, so it's like we kind yeah. of have to start coming up with this amalgamation of the pieces of the stories that are palatable and maybe kind of leave out the ones that aren't in order to make this a cohesive story. <laughs> well, and there's different ways to do it. For instance, like in ancient Egypt, everybody was worshiping their own God or gods, but as they start collecting together, well, now we have a pantheon because, you know, your God likes my God. Or your God is really my God under a different name. That was another big thing in Greco-Roman times, too. It's like, uh, oh, you worship the sun? Yes, and his name is this, but you call him this, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, But sooner or later, you get to the point where, well, we need somebody on top of all of this so that um, who, who who's not going to smite your enemy tribe over here, but is embracing them all and loves them all equally. And uh, and you, your emperor is his servant on earth. You know, it's the 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 aspect of politics that it undergirds all our major world religions. It's like one of the one of the main um, requirements, necessities for a world religion to become a world religion is that it has to have the political support and it has to uh, be embraced by the people. So it has to. There's all that discussion about whether religion is a, a parasitical thing, like the Marxists say, or it's it's a no, it's a, a, a practical thing that helps people and gives people. Well, to succeed, all these religions that did succeed succeeded because they did both. They were approved by the uh, religious or sorry, the political structure. And generally, they had a lot more say in what the theology was than not. Um, and they had something to offer to people that helped to unite them, even though they're different tribes, different religions, different languages, these kind of things helped unite them in an imperial type setting. So when you get these cosmopolitan empires, you are more likely to get a kind of transcendent sort of deity. So is it for a lot of these religions, um, is, do they evolve over time? Are there any that have just done a, like a constant or is it always they're always changing and adapting to what's going on in the culture around uh, you around, around the faith i mean short answer yeah they're always adapting always adopting <laughs> mutating becoming new things reacting to different things um but there's still we can still see traces of like the earliest forms of religion and for a long time when people were still there were still people living in tribal settings polynesian settings we could see what those earlier stages would have looked like or something very close to them. Um, but yeah, anybody who doesn't believe in evolution doesn't know religious history because religious history is just a Darwinian jungle on steroids. <laughs> Always <have been. laughs> That's a great, well, and can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of these stages? You mentioned that you kind of came up with or or have sort of gleaned from other research this uh, sort of progression or, or set of yeah. stages that a lot of religions uh, have gone through. Could you yeah. describe? Sure. And again, none of this is my idea. This is all my reporting on historians who, who are, you know, the relevant authorities in these matters. Um, the um, There's about seven stages. Um, depending on how you want to break it up, because you can make an argument that even before we were hum human, when we were just social animals, there are all these evolutionary strategies that became co-opted to become religious uh, memes and thoughts later. Um, but if you want to start with prehistory, uh, you go from prehistory to tribal, tribal to uh, shamans, shamans to uh, like a clan a leader type situation, um, city states, to empires. Um, I, I break it down differently in the book, but those are basically how they break out. As your social group gets bigger and more inclusive of other social groups, you see the, the change. Um, and it's interesting because at the very, very oh. earliest stages that we can detect, you know, prehistory, um, it seems like there is no religion. You have people who say, oh yeah, the sun is a god, the moon is a god, 
this, that, and the other, everything basically is a god, but they don't worship them. They don't have any kind of interaction with them. They're just bigger than you are. Um, then you so, get a stage where somebody is a shaman and he says, oh, you know what? I'll be the middleman between you and the god or the ocean or fill in the blank, you know? And once you get a shaman and once you get a chieftain, sometimes they're one and the same person, that's when religion really starts getting going. That's where it gets really ugly in places too. Um, so like before, maybe it may have been like an animism sort of idea, like, you know, there's a spirit yeah. or God, you know, that is nature's a God or whatever. And exactly, then, exactly. and then as soon as I mean, society it starts. In, in different ways. Yeah, it manifests in different ways, but the, the yeah. fact is they don't worship them. They don't have anything, you know, there's no pull, you know, it's not a two way street. Uh, they're just out there and and there's no religious so did that uh, happen generally. as we became more societal like um as we kind of started having structures within society with leaders and um you know everybody's got to have a, a role in society is was that like a natural byproduct of that <laughs> right because at, at first your your biggest group is your own family your own kin your own tribe and then as you get those groups collecting, all of a sudden your chieftain is got all these different kinship groups, you know. Um, man, I feel like I had something else I was going to say too, but basically uh, that's where that's coming from, is that at the more you get, uh, the more complex you get a social structure like that, the more likely you're going to have somebody who stops up. And the shaman was the, like the first really watershed moment when somebody said oh yeah i'll i'll talk to the gods for you and that's that's where it all begins um and it's so funny the shamans that we know of today that still exist or existed in the 19th century when people were studying them they they act just like our faith healers do too uh, today um they really um are like competing magicians and they are always on the on the prowl to, to like expose fake shamans you know uh even though they're all fake they 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 like having uh uh, they don't trust each other and they they constantly have uh duels to see who can get the biggest following by exposing other charlatans david this sounds really interesting to me interesting to me what you're describing um it kind of sounds like uh how we think about in in anthropology which is my background we talk a lot about some of these same kind of levels of societal organization that you mentioned from maybe yep. a tribe or a chieftain or a state or something like that and all of those different sort of I don't want to say levels of society, but kind of they're they're scaled down. It's kind of based yeah. on the size of the population, the size of the social group, obviously with and, something like a tribe or a band being a very small more, number of people. Yeah. Oh, and more ahead. importantly than the size is the amount, the, the, the cosmopolitanness of it. How many different yes. types of, of groups do you have in there? Yeah. Yes. And so is is your idea here basically that religion, like many other social institutions, uh, can kind of scale up or down as needed to support, it sounds like maybe some of the, the political or social objectives of these groups? Yeah. And I don't want to I don't want to say that there's anything groundbreaking in what I'm saying about those evolutionary stages. Um, this has been recognized for a long time and like daniel dennett's book breaking the spell talks about these evolutionary things that turn into religious things um for me the the what's exciting about it is seeing like doing a deep dive into the history of like judaism and christianity and seeing um how monotheism itself came out of all these different ways to have theology does that make sense um that it's it's not just a straight shot from polytheism to monotheism. Does the evolution look similar between like um like say you know um Christianity versus like the Muslim or Jewish traditions? Like is it it does it take a couple of generations? Does it take longer than that? Was it like like what is the I, I guess I'm curious what the diverging paths look like between gotcha. different cultures that adopted, you know, a monotheistic faith from a, like a polytheistic one. <laughs> right. And um, there were a lot of different approaches. In fact, one of the things I talk about is that, you know, we have the one true uh, God right now, 
but it was never a given that it was going to be ours. The Babylonians had one. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, Persians had one. And they, if things had worked out slightly different, we'd all still have a god that we call God, but he's actually a Hura Mazda. He's actually uh, the Babylonian uh, sky god, you know. Um, so it's, it's just funny to see how much Judaism uh, took from, like, Persia, took from Zoroastrianism, took from uh, other religions around the time, Egypt, Egyptian and, and you name it. Um, and especially Judaism as we know it today, no, as we know it now, since like the first century, how much Greek thought went into it. Um, that that kind of blew my mind to see. Uh, Russell Gamerkin is uh, one of the historians who's really done a lot of work on that. He just blew my mind so much that I stopped working on my book and wanted to talk to people about how much younger um uh, judaism is than we think um but since then looking into how messed up islam is from just a historical standpoint blows my mind that the things that have come are coming out now okay i have a follow-up question about that but first i think we need to acknowledge and celebrate your cat that has just joined us can you can you tell us about this lovely i was creature? gonna say i was like what's your void's name <laughs> this one he's is adorable bear. Uh, he's is he was originally sun bear because he's got that little patch on his oh. chest but sun bear became sugar bear became suge and uh yeah he 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 gets uh yes i know yes i know you too sometimes he wants a little more attention than others i've got one two three four other cats beside him <laughs> sitting next to me so i'll oh, see that's yeah, why we'll i know that's more. why we're friends david because you you would like all the cats <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was telling before the show, we're down to a mere 10 cats in the house right now, so, um, and a dog, so they may be making, uh, we may get more guest stars. I love that. They are welcome here. We love our guest stars on this program. And how how did you come to have 10 cats? Say, so how did I, oh, uh, how did Kara, you, you muted yourself. You muted no yourself worries. in the middle of that great question. <laughs> oh, um, short, short answer, it was through cat rescue through cat rescue Aww. yeah i yeah. love that that is yeah. that is a word you know call. as you know I, rob asked this at as like a um q a question but i'm going to ask it now why did any religious historical religious figures have any pets <laughs> <laughs> what a great question yeah what a great question um yeah maybe well i'll have to think about that one i know right I've, that should I've be the topic of your next book Egyptians. My thought immediately went to the Egyptians like, well, they've got a ton of animals in their pantheon, but I don't think anybody actually was a pet. Yeah. I don't think Bass was anybody's pet. You know, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just going to say. I think the real answer is they didn't want anybody detracting from the star power of their main figures. You know, they didn't want uh, uh, any side uh cults developing well no well no i don't like i th it's, in it's interesting because you know in in like greek pantheon like pantheons there's symbolism like athena had an owl um you know oh, artemis yeah. has yeah, yeah, dogs yeah. they're symbols they're not actually like we think of them of like of artemis like you know having a pet owl and hanging out right. with the owl it's more of just I mean, a, a symbolic representation you know yeah, that's actually a really good point yeah, and then on that front, yeah, there's all kinds of animals in religion, for sure, for sure. Well, and kind of to your point again about, you know, different religions going through different stages depending on, you know, the type of society that they're being used. And of course, you know, humans have had a lot of different kinds of relationships with animals over time. And, you know, in current day United States, for example, we think of our most common, you know, friends among animals are like companion animals, like pets, dogs, cats, people have a lot of those. But if you go back into a completely different social setting, your relationship to animals may be something else. Like, you know, our livestock, our, our you know, source of livelihood or uh, things like, like that that are different than the relationships that we currently have. So, Hey, Kara? Yes. Am I cutting uh, out? No, you're fine. I just had a quick oh, question. Okay. A yes, please. For, for David, I think the thing that uh, I think the audience or our viewers would like probably some more detail around why you say a person like Muhammad never existed. 
or or may not have. I mean, if there's, I don't know about you, but when when I first started hearing this, I was skeptical, and this was several years back. And then when I read your book, I thought, "Fuck, he's right. It could be just mythological." But I know you got a whole book about this, so I'm not saying to do that. But maybe point out a couple reasons why he could well be myth mythological. Yeah, let's stick with Muhammad for a second there, because um, um, two recent, really recent books have come out. One's Creating the Quran, and one's Muhammad and the Empires of Faith. Both of them are excellent. Both of them really demolish aspect you know different aspects of muhammad's backstory and yet both the authors say oh but there was probably a real muhammad at the end of the day and i find that happens again and again and again no matter which religion we're talking about no matter which founder figure we're talking about even as they're demolishing everything to the point that well it couldn't possibly exist as we have it today there's just no way that's real they still insist that well there's somebody at the at the kernel of it and I think that's the real difference between mythicist and just your average historicist is um, we just take it a little further and say, yeah, I don't see the need even to postulate that there was somebody when we what we can account for in early Christianity, what we can account for in early Islam, in early Judaism um, and even early Buddhism. We can account for it just fine, whether there was a real person or a bunch of people or just uh, people preaching about this one figure. Um, there seems to be a real temptation to have a single figure that you can say, oh, our guy started this religion. Here's his wisdom. This wisdom thing over here, he said that. You know, It's like Solomon. If you hear something wise, Solomon must have said it. If you hear a good fable, Aesop must have said it. Um, and we see that happening again and again throughout uh religions all through the world all through history less than 24 hours ago i watched a, a dw a german um Deutsche Welle. Docu documentary dw uh -huh. on did jesus exist it was an oh. hour-long documentary and every every uh, point they made was a point that pointed to the fact that jesus did not exist yeah. okay you go through 50 minutes of this damn thing and at the end the the narrator says and there's in, and so experts today see there's still incontrovertible proof that Jesus actually exists. Yeah. See here's yeah. 50 minutes of evidence against it, and then the end is oh no, all experts agree he existed. It's just so infuriating. They put a lot of time and effort into this damn documentary, and everything they did was agreeing and with again, you up get, until uh, the last five minutes. Yeah, it makes me crazy. It, 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 oh no, I say it makes me crazy because yeah, I've been seeing. In that for 24 years uh, and even in reference books you'll see them demolish like the story of uh of uh ezra and nehemiah just demolish it and then then run back and point back oh but there must have been some history behind it or blah 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 or um uh, uh <laughs> there was a great uh talk about um the book of acts luke's book of acts and saying something to the effect of well, it's it's uh, it doesn't lend itself well to historians. For the theologian, it's a treasure trove, and it's like, are you listening to yourself talk? What did you just say? Um, Christians are always doing that, and it's not just Christians; they're all doing that, all of them. So, yeah, uh, and and it's not just Western religions either. Same things happening with Buddhism, with uh, with. Uh, Taoism, with uh, you name it, um, uh, Confucianism, even um, there's there's evidence. I mean, we can't say one way or the other, but there's some real compelling strains of thought that Confucianism, Taoism, uh, Buddhism, even though they are, they're all very different from each other and they're even opposed to each other in many ways, that they all seem to be spinoffs from Buddhism, and Buddhism and Hinduism seemed to have come from the same exact uh, part of the world at the same exact time. And they all tend to stem from Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is like the wishbone between Eastern and Western religions. Um, I wish I had thought to put that in the book. I may have to slip that in there now before it goes to print. Um, David, yeah. give them an um, overview of what Zoroastrianism is. Because I think once you understand that 
sim simple aspect of a directory and you'll see it everywhere once you understand yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, we could talk all night just about that. Um, and of course I don't have my notes in front of me, so it's gonna be all off the top of my head. But in, in, a, in, in a nutshell, this religion started in like Central Asia, Eurasia, um, in that spot between India and uh, like Afghanistan, like North West uh, India, um, and those plains, uh, the plains, the Iranian plains near there. Um, it became this Persian religion uh, called Zoroastrianism. Now, the funny thing is Zoroastrianism is not the oldest religion in the world. It's just the oldest religion of all the religions we have today. I, I call it the mitochondrial Eve of religions because it came from an earlier uh, worship, a pantheistic uh, religion. But somewhere um, around about 600 or so BC, um, the Persian Empire kind of rebooted it to be the state religion of the Persian Empire. Um, and that rebooted version has had descendants on both Eastern and Western uh, religion. I love that you went with the mitochondrial Eve analogy there. I was just thinking that in my head right before you said it. <laughs> yes, it's the youngest yeah. common ancestor, not the oldest the youngest religion. Common. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. And honestly, evolutionary biologists would have a field day with, with religion. It's just, it's so amazing that when you look at any one religion, I grew up just thinking, oh, there's these monolithic blocks, Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism, and they're all very, very different. They're all their own thing. But no, they're all so interconnected with each other. And you can actually trace this idea comes from here, and they got this idea from here. Um, yeah, it's it's wild. And what really blows my mind, though, recently, as an atheist who accepted that all these religions are you know, more or less fake— is just how much younger they are than we ever expected, even including the Eastern side. Um, we don't wow. even have any kind of writings for Buddhism or any anything even in India um, until like the third century, second century BC. Um, and uh, and some of the ones, some of the earliest Buddhist writings we know now are modern fakes from the Victorian era. It's like, it's, it, gets, it gets worse. No matter how you slice it, it just keeps getting worse. When you look at religions, um, wow. it's funny. There's one religion. When I set out to write the book, there's one religion that thought, "Well, you know what? This is probably not going to fit the same pattern. It's too new." What religion was that? It's not one of the spinoffs like Scientology or Mormonism. It's an actual full one, full fledged, its own thing. Sort of, sort of, in the way that all religions are. I was going to say heaven. Oh, heaven oh, escape. Kevin. Kevin's got it. He spelled it wrong, but yeah, Sikh. She Sikhs? Oh, really? Oh, okay. The Sikhism is younger than America is. It's it was uh, it's less than five hundred years old. Um, uh, by the time Columbus had sailed, it was still not a thing. But um, Sikhism has is as has, has has as its founders these ten figures called the gurus, and the more you dig at their backstory, it seems like. Maybe we don't have any solid historical information until the fifth guru, halfway through that lineup. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe the, the there were a couple of ones that were earlier on that were real, but their their main founder figure, Guru Nanak, he seems to be um, a not, not if not totally mythological, copying what other earlier uh, figures were doing, and and I talk about that earlier figure and earlier religious movements too. Um, but yeah, everybody else seems to be just completely made up and it's just, there's really no two ways about it. It's like, yeah, there's just no way this person could be a real person in so many cases. So, yeah. What do you think are some of the common threads that you saw repeated over and over again, where you were able to kind of see, oh, this came from here and this came from here and right. look, here it is again. Like, what are those right. elements? Well, I think one of the biggest one is they start as um, is they they're, they're once upon a time stories right out of the box. We don't have any of the actual original stories. We don't have like for the first generations or first hundreds of years or so. There's nothing. There's just nothing. And yet 
when the scriptures show up, they're telling the story of this thing that already happened back in the day. Um, there's all for all the major world religions. I mean, there's bajillions of world religions, world religions in the world that will never be world religions like Scientology. But uh, but the ones that became world religions are ones that had the backing of the political power structure. Um, it seems like you you what if you want a transcendent God, you've got a a, a single emperor or king over a bunch of different people, a bunch of different cultures, uh, and they all need to coalesce and work together. And uh, and so that's what happens is you get this transcendent God who's above them all. Um, and it didn't have to be Jehovah. There's there so many others that could have been. Yeah. Ooh, so what this is a completely off the wall question, but like, given what you know now after your research, if you were to imagine a, another, a different made up religion that you just thought up, like, what what would it be like if you yeah. thought this religion is one that could take off, this could become a major world religion, oh, what, what kind of pieces would it have? Oh, uh, well, in a way, I hate to even say it. The MAGA cult is well on its way to becoming not a major world religion, but it's definitely a religion because um, that that is a freaking Ooh. cult happening. It, all the all, it's got all the aspects of a cult, and oh, including it's detached from reality. Um, oh, so. we have another cat. It is it, it is international. Like there are people in Australia and in England that have fallen under the um well, have got yeah. have boarded the Trump train. You don't so have to it go is that a, far. Canada, the whole central Canada, part of Canada. I know, I know Rob. <laughs> but there's, just... there's, there's literally a, a guy in India who worships Trump as a god, full on. No, no, yeah. No qualms about so, it. So, so getting back to, like, this is just um, getting back to, like, this phenomena, like, and um, previous talks you've done about this idea of a savior. Like it, it tends yeah. to be a, a repeating pattern we do about like, yeah. like there has to be like, I don't, I don't want to do it myself. I have to put it onto a savior figure. Right. right. <laughs> and that's, that's a whole strand of itself. Um, Cause a lot of religions didn't have anything like that. You just had to be in the tribe and you were one of God's people. Um, in fact, in, in earliest forms of Judaism, um, they didn't even believe there was a heaven or hell to go to. You just obeyed God because he's the boss. He's the big guy. So you do what he says. That's it. There's no, and we're going to live with him in heaven afterwards. You know, that just wasn't even part of the equation. Um, there was a time when we had pantheons and then we had a thing in the Hellenistic period called savior cults, mystery faiths. Um, and all these mystery faiths, which actually they come from a movement even further back than that. But during the Hellenistic time, during Alexander the Great's time, when when you've got all these different cultures coming together, the the hot religious idea at the time was personal saviors. This these gods who they um, each each they were all rebooted local gods like Mithra, like Isis, you know, you name it, all over the place. Um, and by participating in things like baptism by participating in things like the Lord's Supper or the Lady's Supper in the case of Isis um, in, in these rituals and and these secret teachings you would be saved they would come live in your heart and we have writings from people in Greece talking about how Isis was their personal savior how they felt they were reborn on that day that they, they became initiates in the cult um, it's it's spookily eerie um, reminiscent of early Christianity. And we, uh, uh, there's, there is um, historical arguments to be made that Christianity started as a Jewish version of these mystery faiths. And I think Richard Carey has made a great argument for that and uh, others. And I'm totally on board with that because everything we see in early Christianity makes sense as a Jewish version of the mystery faiths. Um, so, uh, earlier before that you didn't have that but having a having a personal savior is just kind of a, a it's a very western religion uh particular strand but it's not the oldest and it's it's kind of one of the newer strands as far as religions go and a lot of them just didn't see the need for that at all but it's pretty irresistible idea 
something in the chat yeah. saying something about Zoroastrianism, but I'm not can't read it. I can only read the first couple words. Oh, uh, okay. So oh, they're, I think they're asking is it is Judaism older than Zoroastrianism? It is not. It is not. Uh, Judaism clearly, clearly um, gained a lot of 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 its doctrines directly from the Persians, uh, from the Babylonians, from uh, the Assyrians, um, after the Babylonian exile. Um, and it's not until after the Babylonian exile, or I should say shortly before the Babylonian exile, that we even get any kind of real history in the Old Testament. Um, uh, and again, I'm, I, even as I say that, I'm just like, well, but then again, then again, there's there's a lot to unpack there. So let's let, maybe not go there. Um, it's it's nuanced. <laughs> we'll say it's nuanced. It's nuanced. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but basically, yeah, we would not have Judaism if it weren't for the Babylonians, the Assyrians, mm -hmm. and the Persians. Yeah. Or, and the Greeks, yeah. for that matter, and the Greeks. And we could talk, if you want, we could well, then, deep dive into the story of Moses, the story of the story of Moses. We could talk about Judaism in the fifth century. Um, uh, we can talk about any- if you, can, if you can do that in 15 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, that's the thing. This is the thing, yeah. Do um, it. Do I'm it. I'm talking to a guy who thought I could do all Give this in one book. Give us the notes version. <laughs> I want I guy. want some pre Moses shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or give us just a couple of highlights. That give us the, the most interesting here's bits. A, yeah, okay, that sounds most, good, Tara. <laughs> the most interesting things about early Judaism have come out from Russell Gamerkin, and he has pinpointed. Okay, you know what the the Septuagint is? The first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses. Um, do any guess when? Okay, Moses is sometime between. 16th century or 10th century BCE, supposedly. How old do we think these five books of Moses are? I'm, I should know the answer to this question. I'm gonna guess something like second century BCE. You're good, you're good. Yeah, that blew my mind when I found that out because I'd always assumed that at the latest, they were like post Persian, you know, post Babylonian exile. But no, they are so much later. In fact, he's pinned it down to, they were written in Alexandria in the year 273 or 272. That's how much of a pinpoint we have on when those first five books of the Bible were written. Um, and you don't have Judaism even that early, uh, or at least we don't have any evidence for Judaism for like another hundred years after that, 75 to a hundred years after that. Um, Oh, oh and I see. That could be really? that could be the piece that's really confusing for people who are thinking Judaism or Christianity must be the oldest religion because it's set at a uh, date that so far precedes the actual writing yeah. of the texts. And yeah. if you don't know that the texts were written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, you're going to think that it's much older than it is. Yeah. And it looks like Michael McNeely is starting to say something about the Septuagint that it's younger than Homer. That's totally true. In fact, the Septuagint, those first five books of the Bible are completely dependent on Greek writings. And we can we can find exactly where it is. And Russell Gamerkin's written uh, two, at least two books and he's written a, right, working on a third right now, pinpointing, yeah, this is coming from this, this is coming from this. And before this, you don't have this. And uh, yeah. And it, it blows my mind. Okay. It blows that my was... mind that that's the case. And yet here we are. Yeah. And I mean, that just really just goes to show, you know, how many of us, we learn these texts as if they're like literal histories. Yeah. And yet we don't at the same time learn, when is this text from? When was this written? Right. Where was this written? Right. What do we know about it? <laughs> and here's the thing. It's like, even our idea, if we have a rough idea of how, uh, Israelite and Judahite history went. It's like we're. Pr if you know the first thing about that, you're probably mistaken because David, Solomon, those guys probably did not exist. Or if they did, nothing like what we think they are. In fact, I'm very confident saying, yeah, there was no David, there was no Solomon. Totally confident saying there was no united monarchy, no kingdom of David, no kingdom of Solomon, and. That is something like you'll hear even atheist historians for a long time have said, oh, no, no, there was this. It's like, no, there was not. We have, All the evidence we have for that fits in a shoebox and none of it is even 
even uh, uh, a, a smoking gun. It's it's all very uh, very very dodgy. Um, we don't we don't start getting real history as reflected in the Bible until a hundred years or so after David and Solomon. And ironically enough, the first dynasty that gives us real history that we have and when I say that history that's corroborated by other historical things outside the Bible. Um, it's the dynasty that gave us Jezebel and Ahab. The two of the most hated people in the Bible were awesome uh, monarchs in real life. And they we know they were real people. Um, Hezekiah, we know he was real. But like his whole story in the Bible, yeah, none of that happened the way you said it did because we have the, the writings of everybody else and we have the, they've got the tax receipts, you know, of what happened. And uh, yeah, it, it blows my mind. Yeah. So, so much of the Old Testament is, is just not real stories of real people at all. Even things like Ezra and Nehemiah that are, are purported to be showing the history of after the exile. It's like, no. Um, hmm. And it, it's honest, it's really kind of laughable when you follow some of these historians who take a deep dive into the pointing out how their stories don't add up. Because um, it's just ridiculous how they don't add up. It's yeah. really, really funny, and uh, well, it blows my mind. Yeah, and I know this this may be too detailed of a question to really get into um, this late in the program, but how can you give us just like an overview of how do you know if some of these stories in the Bible are historical or not? What are some of the ways that you will evaluate and analyze whether, okay, yeah, this right, checks right. out or no, this yeah. clearly never uh, happened? Um, one, big, one big thing is, the more we know about, about the neighboring uh, civilizations in the time and the earlier empires and the later empires, the more we find out about Israel's neighbors, the more we find out that, yeah, they weren't quite telling us the truth. But more than that, it's as we see how much younger these stories are. I mean, these stories weren't even imagined until a, a thousand years or so later than we thought. Um, and that's a big, that's a big okay. chunk of it, too. So it's it's things like, like they don't match or comport with other records from the time period, or we know right. that the earliest version of it didn't show up until much, much later. Right. I, I can give you a super specific example. Um, okay. This is something that bugged me as just a historical fan trying to make sense of the Old Testament, was there's this group of writings called the Elephantine Papyri. Elephantine is this Jewish colony in Egypt, the, the mercenary colony, um, and during the whole 5th century, we have a hundred years of their correspondence, letters, um, documents, you, you name it. We've got all this writing, a century's worth. Um, and, and in those writings, we find out that these Jews who lived in, in Egypt in the 5th century BCE, um, they don't seem to know anything about Moses at all. They seem to worship not one god, Yahweh, but maybe five different gods, including a goddess, in their temple. They, their temple, who worships these five gods, is on first name basis with the temple in Jerusalem. They have no problem with any of this. Um, they don't know what Passover is. They get a letter from a Persian governor, a non-Jewish Persian governor, who's telling him, here's how you celebrate this, this holiday. Blah, 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 blah. Um, they greet each other with things like, "May this is Jews talking to Jews. May the gods bless you, my brethren. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, it's just point by point by point. It's like, these are not the Jews we are looking for. These are, these are not. And I always thought it was some kind of the Jews that time forgot that they went off and they were some spinoff. And, and, and no, they were, they were in close communication and on good terms with the Jerusalem temple at a time when only the Jerusalem temple was supposedly the one true temple and none of the other religious shrines were supposed to happen. It's like nothing, we see nothing like that in the Bible. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I can, we can talk more about those guys too. But these are the kind of things, it's like the more we find out from archaeology and history about what was going on at these various times, the more we realize, A, these stories are much younger than we thought, and B, the real history is either lost to us or is nothing like what it's saying it is. Interesting. And so, you know, it's interesting to me that you kind of mentioned there are these ways 
you can tell some of these are just completely, you know, not matching up. And yeah. why do you think it is that this isn't taken up more in some of the scholarship in like religion departments or, or something like that? Is it just that this isn't really that interesting because they're thinking of these as well, just mythological texts to begin with? Well, if I'm talking about it, there's, it's on people's radars already. I, it's this, this is just a cutting edge of this. Um, but when you look at the way historians talk about, for instance, the Old Testament in particular, um, they always treat it with kid gloves, always. And even historians who weren't Jews or weren't Christians, they still tend to accept the general twist of it. Uh, but there's historians like Francesca Stravakopoulou, uh, uh, Mario Liberani, uh, uh, John Barton. Uh, there's a whole wave of the last 50 years. 20 years or so where people are kicking the tires and realizing, yeah, none of this happened the way it says it does. And our, our, our picture of what life was like in Judea and Israel before the Babylonian exile, um, it's clearly polytheistic. I mean, we even have old Testament prophets complaining about women in the temple, uh, praying for, uh, Tammu, weeping for Tammuz and men praying to the sun and, uh, and having idols of, of horses and things like that and bulls. And um, again, the book, the, the book that I've written is 900 pages or more uh, when it's done. And we get into all that stuff, all that. It just, it's so funny. No matter how you slice it, wham, it just is mind blowing. It's, it just is it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, it, it really again, is. This is, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and, and like, just to focus on the Jesus historicity question, the yeah. the thing that Christians love to throw at us is, like, oh no, all historians agree that there was a real Jesus. Well, for starters, no, they don't. <laughs> for second, <laughs> if you put all these historians in the room and and take the secular ones and the religious affiliated ones, they're believing in a Jesus that debunks the other one. It's like, yeah, we're not saying your guy existed, and, and they're not, yeah, it, yeah, it completely debunks yours. So it's not even a question like, oh, to be good atheists, we have to believe Jesus didn't exist. No, we're fine either way, honestly. Oh. It's no skin off our nose at all. I the only reason I'm I... interested in it is kind of, it, it just blows my mind that the more you look, it's like, what can I tell you? These guys did not exist. So it's and, kind of like, any... I, I feel like I'm. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was going to say, it just, it reminds well, I, me of like, like it, anytime you get a group of academics in a room together and you ask them to answer a question about their field, it inevitably, inevitably becomes, well, what does this word even mean? So it's like, well, did yes. Jesus exist? And the answer is going to be, well, what do you mean by Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. like I, I, I've always seen the attitude that even if he did exist as a person, that doesn't mean he was miraculous. He doesn't mean he was magic. Oh, so sure. even and if he existed as and, a and as as a historical figure, yeah. it'd be like contributing, you know, magical powers to Henry the Eighth. You know, like okay, he existed, sure. but as far as magic, he, I'm like, nah, he, probably not. <laughs> exactly. But here's what bugs me about that: is they they tend to point that out that this is the rational middle ground that we should hold up and this is what we should believe that he was just a dude and it's like that's fine if it's true but the more we look at it the more we realize he probably wasn't even a dude because of the way they talked to him because of the way the bible's written because of the way the first century played out it's like it's it's a stretch to even say that and right. that's what that's something i would like to see is this is the only reason I think it's even important to have this debate between atheists and Christians, or I should say between secular historians who think there was a Jesus and atheists who don't think there was a Jesus. The only reason we should even debate about it is because the more we find out in the back and forth of what mm -hmm. we really do know about Jesus, the more we realize, yeah, we don't know a lot. There's what we can say. Um, recently, I was asked to review uh, Bart Ehrman's debate with uh craig evans and, and um on can we trust the new testament on the historical jesus and it felt like i was debating it because we were so on the same page and everybody knows bart ehrman is sure there was a jesus and and makes a big deal about how 
you know, mythicists and, and historicists are enemies. But honestly, when it comes to what we know about Jesus, everything we know about Jesus comes from these four books. All those four books, the Gospels, come from the first Gospel. All Everything in the Gospel seems to be a complete allegory. It's like, if we only depend on the Bible, we don't have a Jesus anymore, whether there's so a real it, Jesus or not. Because so um, just to be clear, outside of the four Gospels and the first Gospel, there's no historical account of a yeah. Jesus from Nazareth, you know, that follows the narrative that's shown in the Gospels. <laughs> Right. And, and there's some nuance for that as well. Okay. Um, we don't have any com contemporary corroboration for those Gospels. And the things we do, I, I talk about a great length in Nailed and Jesus Mything in Action, um, mm -hmm. are clearly dependent on those Gospels. And before those Gospels are written, Christianity is a completely different animal. Um, and so, yeah, whenever I hear anybody throw the consensus at me that all historians believe in a Jesus, that historical consensus starts breaking down as soon as you ask well what was jesus who was he what did he really do and what he didn't do um then yeah. you, then you've got a ton of jesus yeah, yeah. the jesus yeah. of and faith and the jesus of history are, are just figureheads for a whole family tree of jesus's yeah and i think that's a really important point even though we were kind of joking about it a few minutes ago of oh okay well ask the historians and they'll say what do you mean by jesus but like i mean yeah. actually that is kind of the crux of this right like for people who yeah. say yeah there may have been a historical jesus pro i i would bet that not one of those who is a serious academic is saying there was a historical jesus who was born to a virgin and was crucified right. and then resurrected on the third day and ascended to heaven right. like that is yeah. not a claim that i think any serious academic person is making right no and and the only point i want to bring up is like yeah that's a given that's a given but what i'm saying is we shouldn't make the default but there was a guy that's not necessarily true uh, there's a great uh, critique of Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? by Philip Davies. And he criticizes them for general attitude of, oh, no, it's ridiculous to think there, there was, of course, a guy named Jesus. Yeah, it's like, dude, maybe, but it is not a given at all. And I would argue we're well past that. We are well past that. Um, and part of the reason that brings us back to this new book is that it's not just Jesus who has this dodgy thing you see the same patterns repeating themselves. Even you see the same patterns in the way that modern scholars deal with their pet subject, Zoroaster or Moses or Muhammad. It's like, even if you're not Islamic, you don't say there was no Muhammad, you know, A, because you'll get killed, but, but also you won't have any credibility in the field of wider field of Islamic studies. Not to say there haven't been historians who That's, have said wow. that. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That I didn't I I didn't know that and that's really really interesting. Um yeah. that you can't even say like to be taken seriously you have to say well Muhammad at least existed. <laughs> You know, that's that's right. very interesting. This is probably a good point to kind of move towards wrapping up. Um, David, where can people find your book? When does it become available? Several people have asked us the title of it in the chat already. Where do we go to get our hands on this? Right. So it is in in the it, the book is written. Therefore, now it's being proofed and edited and formatted and it's all self-published. So it's I'm hoping to get it out by this summer. Um, it's as soon as I can, I'll get out. It's called Playing God, a Evolutionary History of World Religion. Um, if you follow me on Facebook, um, if you um, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me and, and stay tuned for for a, uh announcements and things like that but i expect it's still a couple months out and um but 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 this year not gonna are you gonna do an audio book yep gonna do an audio book as well okay that, <laughs> cool but uh, <laughs> yes. it's gonna be three it's gonna be three books just like jesus mything in action was and they're big books it's over 900 pages where can people find your if you want to talk about historical jesus where can people find that book <laughs> gotcha so there's a book called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths that Show Jesus Never Existed at All, and a three-part book called Jesus Mything in Action. Nailed started out just as me uh, in 2010 saying, this doesn't add up. None of this adds up. Uh, and that's coming from somebody who, like, as an atheist, I just assumed there was a Jesus. 
never crossed my mind that there wouldn't have been until I started looking about, well, hey, this gospel says this, this gospel says that. I wonder which one's giving us the real story. When you start looking for the real Jesus behind the gospels, that's when, as I say, once you pull that thread, pretty soon you have no sweater. Um, it talks about the top 10 ways that Christianity just doesn't pass the test for uh, an actual person. Jesus Mything in Action, the sequel to that, talks about not just, no, this didn't happen, but this is what looks like happened. This is what the Gospels look like. This is what Jesus looks like in the New Testament. This is what he looks like outside the New Testament. Um, this is uh, how we would, if we were going to go back in time to find early Christianity, this is what we would have, all the places we'd have to go. So it's, it's, if you're interested in that at all, and it's really fascinating, uh, that's where I would go. And now playing God is just that on steroids. It's saying not just Jesus, but Moses, but Buddha, but Muhammad, but this guy, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. Um, and it seems to me, the nutshell of that is, it seems to be the norm that world religions start with an imaginary founder, not some, it's not some crazy crackpot theory. I was going to say that Neil sounds like a title of a book that Dr. Ray would give a, a book on um, biblical history. I'm just going to say, but so, that was clever. Um, but we can uh, move into Q&A. Um, yeah. So why don't we do that? Um, I'm going to start uh, with the first question we got is the idea that God's love and care for all humans and want the best for you specifically. Is that a relatively new thing? Were there, yeah. were they usually nearly apathetic to humans or only expecting them to be good footstools? It, y yes, 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 and yes, all those things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can go deeper into that, but yeah, exactly right. Initially, you don't have people asking anything of their gods or expecting anything from their gods. It's not until much later that they like, and do it because you go into paradise. And interesting, fun fact, Paradise is a Persian word that we got from Zoroastrianism. The idea that there was an afterlife that wasn't just a big gloomy cave where everybody goes in and does nothing, the idea that there might be something better than that comes straight to Western religion through Zoroastrianism. This next question is a fun one. I like talking about fun things, so we're, we're two for two so far. Yeah. Um, someone asked, looking back on history, which god do you think would have been the best heavy air quotes on best uh, God for the world to end up with. Oh man. See, here's the thing about religions is even the nice ones, they have a bad side. <laughs> and it's like, even if, even if every, any religion, any one of them was just nothing but positive beneficial things, um, you'd still be, have the problem that they're not real. And um, it becomes that thing where, do we believe in it because it's good for society for us all to believe in it? Or do we believe in it because it's true? And one thing I like about the modern atheist movement is for all its faults, one thing it says is we don't have to lie to each other to be good people. There's good reasons to be good to each other. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, if pressed, maybe you could say some form of Buddhism that's very stripped down and just talks about, you know, focusing on you as a person, the inside and getting along with other people. Um, some kind of Quaker Buddhism maybe might work out as a religion, but it's like, why, why bar even bark up that tree? Let's, let's look at reality for what it is and how we can be better. Cause we're all in the same boat, you know, we're all humans. Um, yeah, it's it's up to us, really. Good answer. I like that. That's answer. a great question. As a as a former polytheist, I really like that answer. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, do you have any predictions for how religions might evolve in the future? Do you think Christianity could evolve back to polytheism? That's an interesting question. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. When I worked for Secular Student Alliance. And this was about 2013, I think, is when the study came out. All the figures for religious, atheist, spiritual, but not religious, they were pretty much neck and neck. But the religious kept going down and atheists kept going up. I don't know what that's gone like since in the last 10 years or so. Um, but 
that was good news at the time. One thing that one of the many ways that we were going backwards is the Trump cult. Not only do they not care about so many things, democracy, for instance, they don't even care about reality. Um, they just don't care. They're fact proof. And that kind of terrifies me. Um, and I, it's funny. It's ironic because like 15 years ago, I was saying, here's what's happening. Christianity is shrinking. But as it does, it's shrinking in order of the most rational and loving first. So it's like the smarter you are, the less likely you are to be a Christian. And I don't mean that in a slam. But what I mean is like the ones who study Christianity most are the most likely to leave Christianity. The ones who embrace humanistic values are the ones most likely to get disgusted with Christianity, leaving us with the crazy, crunchy, nutty center of crackpot that is MAGA and everything else we see. Um, uh, and that's that's scary. But it, it's not really answering the question. You're wondering what religion could evolve into. It's more like they're devolving into, into uh, fundamentalism and fascism well, there, for and, life, and there is a trend among like millennials and gen zers to become spiritual yeah. so right. you know they leave right. traditional religion but they fall into like some sort of like spiritual like you know universal consciousness blah 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 blah, blah yeah. sort yeah. of and that's idea. what i'm afraid of yeah we're just gonna get which some is also down so yeah. bad <laughs> yeah. so bad a lot we're of a lot of bad shit <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Uh, you, when you talk about what religion would be a good religion, it was like, even the good ones are so easily co-opted into cults, you know, and cultic thinking and magical thinking, you know, it's just such a slippery slope. There's um, there's too to there's even... too many avenues for people that are abusive to get into position, positions of power to take sure. advantage of people. Sure. And that's that's so the problem true. with any sort of um yeah. belief that's not based in reality yeah yeah <laughs> and you could see that in the book you could see that even at the very earliest start with the shamans it's like boom everything you see coming from a tv evangelist you see happening in the neolithic period with those guys yeah okay these are great questions well, by the way. Well, really good. we have we have yeah. very smart people that attend the, yeah. these meetings <laughs> and we curious do. people i love our our attendees. We always get such good questions and good hangouts and chats and really good book recommendations, which brings me to our next question here. Someone is oh, wondering yeah. if you can recommend two or three good fundamental books on the history of world religions, obviously in addition to your own. Yeah. Um, I mean, short answer, yes. And I, I mentioned them all in every chapter for further reading, read this, that this, this. Um, it depends which in, which religions you're interested in, and not, not to be a cop out. It's just there's so many of them. Um, uh, one one thing, if you want to look at the bare bones, I love uh, Daniel Dennett's book Breaking the Spell. Uh, Robert Wright's book um, The Evolution of God is a huge influence on the first part of the book, but um, we we part ways quickly, and you'll probably see where exactly where we do because he tends to accept uh, uh, uncritically a lot of things that I think just don't hold up anymore um as far as christianity and jesus in particular um uh my book uh anything by robert price anything by uh richard carrier um i think a lot of things by bart Ehrman, even though he's such a staunch historian i've been he's one of the best mythicist writers out there because everything he argues helps the mythicist cause as much or better than his own cause, this lifted profit. Um, I'll stop it there because we could go on all night just talking about that. Yeah, but I'm going to ask one more yeah, question. If, want, if anybody wants to, oh, well, wait, wait. If anybody does want a uh, question I didn't answer, email me at everybodylovesdave at gmail.com <laughs> and I'll be happy to, to give you more info. But the this all, it gets covered in the books too, I hope. You were, you were saying. Yeah, right, um, by the books. By the books. <laughs> By the books. Support Dave for all the hard work he did. 900 pages is a lot of work. So do the thing. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. that. You're welcome. I will you. show for you, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to ask one more question before we yeah. um, wrap up. Are you doing going to hang out for the hangout for a little bit? 
I can do it for a little bit. I, I think okay. there's people downstairs waiting for me, but we will let we just Okay, you just let us know when you're like, okay, I gotta go do the thing, and that's fine. So I'm yeah. going to ask one more question. Was numbers yeah. just fake genealogy? <laughs> <laughs> was numbers just make genealogy um i'm gonna go out on a limb and say yes uh yeah i'm gonna sort of say yes and leave it at that perfect and, and, okay i'll say a little bit more the 12 <laughs> tribes that whole idea that there were 12 of them first of all it's not biblical because there was there's more of them than just 12 and those names don't align with anything historical and that whole idea came from homer that whole idea that there were only 12 of them came from homer all right. Well, um, David, like, I feel like you can come back again and talk more about this topic because I think I always feel like when you're here, we just scratch the surface of all these different topics. And it is always really, really fascinating. So thank you. Well, thank um, you guys. And thank all you do. Because again, Recovering for Religion Foundation is a huge part of what's kept me going on this. Uh, yeah. Yay! Hey, love what you guys oh, do. I love that. We're so cool. <laughs> no, thank you. And we're and we <laughs> we love supporting you and all the work that you do because you offer education and different perspectives to people that are going through the process. So, you know, that's always really really great for them to have more resources and more education. So, thank you so much for your contributions to um, the wider community that are going through deconstruction and, um, or just want to become, um, have bigger brains. So, yeah, you know, thank I you like so that. much. <laughs> like so anyway, yeah. so let's all say thank you to David. Yay. Okay. So <laughs> thank you everybody. Um, next you week we are go So next week, if you want more information into your brain brain, um, we are going to have, um, uh, Mateo Montero, who will be speaking again, on crimes of faith in latin america so that will be the talk next week so um same bad time same bad channel so please show up for that so um moving on um i lost my notes give me one second oh here i am okay so you are all very um internet savvy people so you need to follow us on all the social media so you're going to go to the facebook main page you're going to go to the Facebook support group page. You're going to the artist formerly known as Twitter, now known as X. You're going to go to the Instagram. You're going to go to the TikTok. And you're going to go to um, YouTube and put in RFRX. And there's 185 episodes as of March 25th. So you're going to go subscribe and get more information into your brain and into your ear holes and become a smarter person because we all want to have big brains. Okay, I shilled for the stuff that we do. Kara, what are we doing now? <laughs> yes. We are going to talk briefly about volunteering and how that can help everyone out. And then we're going to hear from Daryl, who is dying to give us his thoughts on this talk. So real quickly, uh, just wanted to mention, we have learned that healing can also come from helping others. And as David mentioned, RFR does a whole lot of things to try and help people out. And a lot of our volunteers have found that they also find meaning and purpose through volunteering with us. And all of the services that we provide are supported entirely by volunteers and donations. And so as a result, we are always in need of volunteers and donations. So if you would like to donate with your pocketbook, which is that even, do people have pocketbooks? I, we mean wallet by that, just with money. I if like you want to give us money, please do. <laughs> yeah, or, or I like purse, purse or big yes. bag that holds all my shit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of those things. But also you can volunteer with your time and your talents and your skills and abilities. And we are always in need of people to help us out with all kinds of things. And it doesn't just have to be answering the phones or the chats on the helpline or the support groups. It can be doing things like moderating the online community community or helping us behind the scenes with video editing or tech support or project management. Uh, we're still looking for web developers and it doesn't have to be anything quite that specialized either. Whatever your skills are, if you have time and interest in volunteering, we would love to hear from you. So check out our page at recoveringfromreligion.org slash volunteer to read about what that would involve and how you can volunteer. 
So um, that is it from me. Before we move to the Hangout, I cannot wait to hear from Dr. Daryl Ray, our president and founder to wrap us up for the evening. And as we mentioned before, Daryl has read the book. So lay it on us, please. Well, thank you. And thank you, David. This, I cannot tell you how fun a read that this was. I, I looked at it at 900 pages or whatever it was. I don't remember how many pages. I can't do this. Dave asked me to read it to, you know, possible endorsement. But I got to start, start reading, and I read the whole damn thing in in less than three days, probably two and a half days. I mean, I just could not put the damn thing down. But that's that was true when I read Nail. It was true when I read Jesus Mything in Action. It was true when I read The Mormons. Everything Dave writes is compelling. I, he's got such a writing style. I'd say he's the second best writer I can name. Um, I'll tell you who the first best is here in a minute. Anyway, uh, thanks, Dave. This has been very good. And I, you guys have not got one one hundredth of what's in those books tonight. I'll, and I'll guarantee you, when you leave those books, you'll, you'll have whole new ways of thinking about the whole evolution of, of, um, of religion. Now, I will say the first best writer is a guy that named the uh, guy that wrote The God Virus, by the way. Oh, and, and here's good a- book. <laughs> yeah. God and sex even better (laughs) well yeah you would say that (laughs) but the reason I I don't usually show my own books here but uh, while you're waiting for David's book to come out read the God virus because I here's what I'm and the reason I say that is because the God virus is almost a prequel to everything David writes because I'm writing about how religion evolves and then David shows you how it evolves so Anyway, uh, that's your assignment. Get get online and read The God Virus and then read Dave's books. Uh, David, uh, years ago, I mean, this is like back when I was in the seminary. Uh, you probably knew I was in seminary. I got my master's degree in religion at seminary, Scarrett College for Christian Workers. And I wrote, <laughs> I, re- I read uh, uh, Albert Schweitzer's book, Quest for the Historical Jesus. And I was curious, what is the historical evidence for Jesus? And, of course, he wrote this book in, like, 1900. And I finished reading the book, and the last sentence or two of the whole book basically says, hey, we don't know what the fuck's happened, but just have, just have faith. And I'm thinking, yeah. Albert Schweitzer, yeah. you're probably one of the most intelligent people on the planet, and all you got for me is just have faith? He gave the whole analysis. Uh, I mean, for 1900, he pretty much concluded <laughs> yeah. we don't even know if the guy existed or not. I don't know. Have you read that book? This quest for the historical genius. It, it's been a while, but it, yeah, his that was his wrap up. Is like at the end, it's the Jesus of faith who we have anything to do with, not the historical oh. Jesus. You know what's so, funny about that though? I, I got to tell you this. Uh, I was giving when I was first giving my first lectures about. Hey, I, I think maybe there wasn't a Jesus at UC Berkeley. There was an Anglican priest with collar sitting right in the front row the whole time. He was going like this. <laughs> and afterwards, he came up to me and said, yeah, they told us all this in the seminary in the 1940s. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, my mind. Oh, my mind. It's like, how? how? So the, yeah. this, I, yeah, this idea these of going, these are not, they're not, all, they're not new ideas. Back in the 1840s, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the, Feuerbach, Feuerbach's work on yeah. Jesus basically said the same thing. We don't know who the fuck this guy was or if he even existed. Right. So what What a reason I bring all this up is and it related to David's book is, is that people have been looking at this stuff for about 200 years and, and they've been coming to the same conclusion that probably didn't exist or may not have existed. And yet, and yet the overwhelming doc, dominant culture of Christianity, or if you're an, or in Islam and Saudi Arabia or wherever, those dominant cultures force the scholarship into a very tight, um, in, into a very tight narrow band, if you will. And yes. uh, I, Hector Avalos talked about that too. Yeah, Hector did. I forgot about that. Yeah, I want to change the subject just a little bit and and hit a couple things because so many people come to us that recover from religion with a fear of hell, and I want to tell you the whole fear of hell bullshit came from 
Zoroastrianism, or at least its roots are in Zoroastrianism. And this notion of two powerful gods fighting between each other, and humans are the balance between these two gods. That's a Zoroastrian concept. The concept of uh, Adhira Mazda and here and and what's the other ones I never uh-huh. can pronounce. Ahriman. Anyway, Ahriman, right? Ahriman. Yeah. So the, you got these two big gods that are controlling the whole world. One is basically good, and one is evil. And, and when you read about how Zoroastrianism framed this battle between the gods, it sounds almost identical to the notion of Christianity of the God and Satan, the yeah. Yahweh and Satan. And that's honestly, where the notion comes from. Yeah. And it, it makes more sense in Zoroastrian because it's like you've got a good God and you've got a bad God. Whose side are you going to be on? You know, exactly. And, and, uh, yeah. And humans are the ones that tip the balance. Yeah. In yep. Zoroastrianism, that's yep. where humans come into this whole thing. Yeah. So you got that. And then you add to that the heaven and hell notion. Yep. So you got good and bad gods, you got good and evil battle, you got the heaven and hell, all those things morphed evolutionarily so to speak out of uh zoroastrianism and of course christians i had a christian professor he and i were best friends for 30 years until one day i said look zoroastrianism morphed into christianity or i said something like that yeah i didn't know what i was talking about except (laughs) that's what (laughs) and now i look and oh he got so mad he said that's not right and so well who was the three wise men if not zoroastrian priests (laughs) yeah well okay he said, no, they couldn't have been that. But anyway, I, I didn't argue. He and I have hardly spoken since. Oh, We've been friends for 30 years. Uh, yeah. There's, so, I mean, uh, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it's not even controversial among historians of religion to, 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 you know, do a tip of the hat to Zoroastrianism because angels, demons, end of the world, all that came straight from Zoroastrianism. Even the, even yeah. the fact that our angels have wings came from Zoroastrianism, you know. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I that did I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. And I'll throw one more thing in for you folks that uh are still interested in Christian theology. Uh Christianity is not, I repeat, is not a monotheistic religion. And mm-hmm. don't let any don't uh, anybody tell you that. Christianity is a polytheistic religion. It has at least at least four gods. And it depends on which version you are. It has five gods. Can somebody name the four or five gods of Christianity? Well, well S- Satan is one of the bad gods, kind of like Loki in uh, Norse mythology. Hmm. Exactly. Satan's right. one of the bad gods. I, I would say the Trinity makes three. That's three. So in Christianity, and in Virgin Virgin Mary, the mother, and the Virgin yeah, and Mary Catholicism, that, anyway, and yeah. and, all, and yeah. all the saints, all the freaking saints you can pray all to, the and saints. to be on your well, the main gods are those are those um, Mary and and Yahweh and Jesus and Holy Spirit and all that stuff. So anyway, that so there's all those gods, and they all act just like they're independent gods. I mean, Satan's certainly independent. Mary's kind of independent. And then, of course, you got the demigods, which are what I would consider the saints. So I every oh, time no, Daryl, Christians... no, no, Daryl, oh, that's not it. That's not... see, it's all very <laughs> the Trinity's all one. See, it's not different. <laughs> you just uh, you just don't understand you Christian theology. You mentioned uh, Quakers earlier uh, as one of the potential ideals, yeah. and I, I would tend to agree. But even the Quakers devolved into some crazy stuff. Uh, later anyway anyway that nixon was a quaker yes yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's this all just shows that them. david needs to come back and we had to have another discussion <laughs> on this particular topic so we're just going to have to book you um after the summer and we'll make it happen <laughs> yep, yep so once again well, helen is gonna... the true way I know. I start. always. I am the planner and networker. That is my goal, <laughs> and my and right. my role. <laughs> Congrats on Next. your new house, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yay. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Well, to wind it no, all up. Nobody say the address on the internet. <laughs> Next. Now, please don't dox me. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> you were saying. All right. Sorry, well, Daryl. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I've had a hard time biting my tongue for the last two hours, David. I'm just telling you, I really have enjoyed this, and it's it's a lot of fun. 
But uh, I want to update you guys a little bit. We're having a big fundraiser coming up Mar May 4th, and we'll have some other things, activities before that. Really hope you can join us. We hope you'll promote the fundraiser because everything we do here at Recover from Religion, including this show, is funded by donations. We don't we don't charge anybody membership. Nobody had to pay a dime to come here tonight. We don't pay our speakers either, as David well knows. But um, support us. Support what we're trying to do and support the fundraiser by letting other people know about it. And uh, one last little thing. We have we have a big announcement coming up during the fundraiser. And we just had a big meeting to finalize it. And uh, it'll all be uh, being announced at that point in time. Anyway, thanks a lot. And back to you, uh, Cara and Helen. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And David, for joining us and all of the volunteers and people who make this happen. It could not happen without all of you. All.